one world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is September 3rd, 2014. Wednesday edition of DTRH. Tonight, I am excited. Coming back to the airwaves is an old friend of mine, very good friend of mine, who we've done, I would probably say, at least 12 or 14 hours of radio together over the years, uh, different broadcasts we've done together. But I'm, I'm really excited because I haven't had her on in a while. And since the last time you know, she was I – mean, she came on when she first started doing radio, when she first got into it. But now it's been a little over a year. And um, I'm just – I'm excited about it because I've been wanting to pick her brain, but now she's also grown – uh, on her own as a radio show host. So I'm just doubly excited. It's kind of, for me, it's kind of neat because it's like seeing my prodigy uh, grow. And, uh, you know, she is now out there doing her own thing, doing amazing interviews. Anyway, if you haven't figured out who my guest tonight is, it's my good friend, Susan Lindauer. And we're going to be getting into the chaos in Iraq, ISIS, and everything else. And I'm going to, first, before we even get into that, I'm going to, when I bring her up here in a sec, I'm going to have her discuss her book a little bit too, Extreme Prejudice, because for you to have any clear understanding of what's going on in Iraq, present day right now, you need to have an understanding of what happened 12, 13 years ago, and what happened, you know, eight years before that, nine years before that. You have to have a complete understanding of the whole picture, and Susan's book and her experience is key. It's key. But then again, if you already know who she is and you tune into her radio broadcast here on Truth Frequency Radio in the weekends, then you already know what I'm talking about. Her book, it, by the way, is called Extreme Prejudice. We're going to plug it. We're going to get into all that. So I don't want to waste any more time because two hours is never enough with Susan. It's just not enough. So without wasting any more time, let's bring her up. My good friend, Susan Lindauer. Susan, welcome back to the broadcast. It's been way too long, dear. Hey, Popeye. I am so proud to have been your prodigy because you are the one who turned me on to radio, and you helped me get my radio show, and I love you for that. Well, uh, I'm very proud of you. I've watched you kind of you know, grow into your, your own as a radio show host, and I remember you were kind of nervous the first show you did, and now you go up there and you knock them down. You, you, you do a strike every time you do a radio show. <laughs> you, know, you knock all 10 pins down, so <laughs> I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Thank that, you. That clapping. Well, I, I tell you, this is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell you something. Um, this is a, a really important 
age, for time, year, these, this, this year, these years right now that we're living through, this is probably the m- most important age of our history. Uh, I believe that our country is, uh, is really turning uh, on the, at the abyss. We're, we're really flirting with the abyss right now. And we're, and, and we, all of us, our audience and our, our hosts and, uh, the blogs and the internet media, YouTube media, uh, we are, it's like we're fighting to protect our democracy and our values and, and to, 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 to get things back where they need to be. Well, that's our jobs. I mean, we're doing, we're doing, I guess, what Chris calls it light work, and other people call it that too. Other people call it that too. I guess you could call it that. We're we're exposing the truth. We're 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 forcing. We're we're being the candle in the middle of the dark room, and we're expo- we're forcing the darkness back. And you know, back in the day, it was just a few of us, but now there's so many more people waking up. It, it really is awesome to see the awakening. You know, especially compared to when, because you know what I mean. I mean, you've been awake. From back in the day, I mean, you went into a friggin' military prison because you had the balls to speak truth to power, and they, they locked you up for it. So you know what I'm talking about. From 2003 until now, there's been a huge awakening. I mean, wouldn't you say it gives you a lot of hope? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that's the thing. We can beat this thing, but we are at a turning point in history where we've got to stand and fight. And, and by fight, that doesn't mean fight to kill, but it means, you know, fight for our values and fight for truth. And we're doing, we, we have the capacity to do it, um, and, and, but we have to have the resolve. Do you know what I mean? I agree. Sometimes things are going to be tough. It's going to look dark, but we have to have the courage to, to get through it. And that's why, look, it, nobody can do it on their own. Everybody is important as an individual. Don't get me wrong. But the only way we're going to get through this darkness is as a team. And as you can see, over the years, it's like certain people are just drawn to each other. And, you know, people are working with one another uh, at, at all different, you know, radio networks and websites and stuff. And everybody, I mean, there's just so many good people out there doing the right thing. And you know, when I first started doing this in 2006, there weren't many of us. And now, I mean, it's amazing. Eight years later, it's amazing. I'm so yeah. Like I, I don't even have to go out on the street and do this, the amount of street actions we used to do, Susan, because there's, there's, it's, it's so effective with what we do on the internet and with the website and with YouTube and everything else. We actually reach more people that way than we would going out on a street corner, you know. And I mean, we, we're the alternative media, literally, is putting yeah. the the mainstream media to bed, which is where it belongs. It's it should be put to bed. Uh, I mean, I, look, if they were any, if they were serious, how come they never had you on about your book? How come they never talked to you about your experience? Oh my God! Oh, absolutely. And and it, when I confront them, and I have confronted them, uh, you know, people like David Corn of the Nation, uh, who is one of my neighbors. He's like, well, uh, you know, the 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 corp- we, we have decided who we're going to listen. We've de- we choose the experts, and I'm like, no, you don't. Like, we, the corporate media, choose the experts we're going to hear, and we decide what is the official story. And that's how they view it. They view it as carving out an official story, like the ridiculous 9/11 narrative, the 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 fantasy around 9/11. Or the fantasy about Iraqi pre-war intelligence, and I—I I guess I should start by telling your audience who don't don't know who I am, why this, why I'm on your show tonight, and why this is so uh, poignant, such a a poignant time for me personally. I was the chief CIA and defense intelligence asset covering Iraq at the United Nations, dealing with ambassadors and diplomats at the UN. Iraqi diplomats from 19, August of 1986, 96, sorry, August of 96 up to the invasion for seven years. And every two to three weeks, I would travel from Washington to New York and sit down with the diplomats and have lunch with them and talk with them and have coffee with them and keep a back channel open. And my specialty was anti-terrorism. I would, all, I would always go to the Iraqi embassy and the Libya house and meet their diplomats and their ambassadors on the same days. So it's impossible for the United States government to say that they didn't know who I was or what I was doing. 
everything that I was doing was being debriefed by the CIA and the, anti and the Defense Intelligence Agency separately. Um, so there was heavy oversight, but also the Iraqis and the Libyans both understood from the very first meeting who I was and what I wanted to do. And I was applying anti... I mean, think how far we've come from this. Back in the day, we used anti... I, I showed that anti-terrorism could be done, could be managed by supporting non-violence in both directions. And if, if the best way, the most effective way to win support and get cooperation was to show that we cared or I cared you know, the United States government didn't care, but I cared. I was the person interacting with them, and I cared as much about their people as I cared about our people because we are a human race, and we are one people under, pardon me, one people under God, if you will. Um, and I know that there are a lot of atheists out there. Don't, don't take offense. But we are one planet, one universal life force. We have one precious earth that we have got to protect. And I respected all of that, all of the, all the different sides, which is why they could work with me. But I came out, I was always anti-sanctions and anti-war. And so the Bush administration, I mean, I have to tell you that what I'm seeing in the aftermath, both at the time of the Iraqi war and today, makes me know absolutely with all of my heart that I did the, I, I did the right thing. I was one person alone, but I, I mean, I, I was one person alone against the Bush administration when it came to that. But in the, in the, in the anti-war movement, there were millions and millions of us. And I was one of, one of millions. But when the Bush administration decided that they were going to tear down uh, the, the real truth about Iraqi pre-war intelligence. They had to destroy me to do it. And then they went out and they told you and the, all the people, and everyone in your audience will know this is true because you'll remember it, that it was bad intelligence that caused Congress, bad intelligence that was fed to Congress that created the decision, resulted in the, the decision, the consequence of the vote for war. And what you were not, and that was an outright lie. I was the chief asset, and I fought passionately, ruthlessly. I, I did every single thing that I could do I, um, to oppose the war. I did everything that you guys did in terms of demonstrations and such, but I live in the Washington, D.C. area, so I had actually gone up to Capitol Hill regularly and had debriefings with members of congressional staff talking about a peace option that we had built uh, from the end of the Clinton administration through the, the, 18, through the six months after 9-11. And I told, I made, or eight, six or eight months after 9-11, and I made sure that everybody was aware that this peace option worked and was viable and could achieve the results that we wanted. And I'll tell you something else that, that people, you know this, but people don't, people are, are shocked to hear this. I personally went to Colin Powell twice before his speech at the United Nations. And I begged him to, to give this peace option a chance. And I said the intelligence that was coming from the Iraqi exiles was horrifically stupid and off, way off track. It was fabricated, falsified, that they were exaggerating every, you know, even if there was a crystal, tiny shred of a sand of truth to it, they were, they were embellishing it and exaggerating it so much because they desperately needed the United States to bring them into power. There was no way that they would ever find support inside Iraq. And I described the aftermath and the consequences of the war with, prof with great accuracy. And now to, to see, you know, and I was vilified, I was demonized, they said I was crazy, I was insane. Bush said, you know, that the, the, my own cousin was the chief of staff to George Bush. His name was Andy Card. 
And so he was receiving, he received 11 debriefing papers from me on the Iraqi situation. So there was no way the Bush administration could say they didn't know. The white, the chief of staff of the White House got these papers. And Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, got these papers. And Colin Powell literally turned them over to the FBI and said, arrest this woman, get her out of the way, you're going to, my reputation must be protected, I want to be saved, and they, um, they, they arrested me to save Colin Powell and to save the whole, you know, Congress. In the, the planned invasion of Iraq, because, you know, you, you were out there proving that, like, Iraq, what, what was going on, what was being said, are two different things. Iraq wanted to work with us against terrorism. Let's, let's get something straight, okay? So people understand something, and Susan can back this up. Saddam Hussein was definitely no saint, but he was CIA, and I don't mean an asset. I mean, he was a card-carrying member. So when it came to him being yes, in charge... Yes, indeed he was. And when it came to him being in charge in Iraq, right, he had the best intelligence in the Middle East outside of Mossad, okay? The Iraqi intelligence... Absolutely. Had, ...hands down. And they wanted to give us everything they had on all these quote-unquote terror groups. And we turned it down, and instead we carpet-bombed them. So what was the real agenda? Is it a war on terror? I think not. Susan, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, well let me just... Let me just I want everybody to think of ISIL today... And then think of Saddam Hussein and what Saddam Hussein tried to give us. Saddam Hussein, as you said, was, was a bastard, but he recognized that anti-terrorism was, uh, uh, he, he deeply was paranoid of young Islamic jihadis because of the poverty of the Iraqi public population under sanctions. And he was afraid that they would take advantage and manipulate the sentiments of the Iraqi people and knock down his secularist government. So he would hunt these people, hunt out the fundamentalists, and try to drive them out of his country. Um, because he was, he, or, but, and, and he would, he would, he would give, he would feed their intelligence to us. Let me give you some examples. Um, before 9-11, and everybody remembers that Bush tried to blame 9-11 on, on Saddam Hussein. In February, what you don't know is that in October, while, while Bill Clinton was still president, uh, the Iraqis had given us advance warning about the bombing of the USS Cole. They had uh, one of these jihadis had come in to their country, and they had caught him planning, conspiring to carry out a terrorist attack. Now, because and because of the U.S. law, or excuse me, because of United Nations prohibitions on Iraq and sanctions and such, there was no way the Iraqis could arrest this, these people. They had to, they, their only recourse was to deport them and ship and tell us. So what they, that's exactly what they did. They deported the fellow and told us that the guy, that they had caught a conspiracy to bomb a, a U.S. ship at a port facility. And I said, well, where did he go to? And they said, he went to Yemen. So then I came back and immediately notified my defense intelligence people, my CIA people, and Yemen was, and then I got a message, which I was also very good friends. I was dating. <laughs> back in the day, you guys, I really had some very high-power boyfriends. <laughs> it's been a while now. I have to admit, it's kind of embarrassing. But um, I, da I was dating the deputy ambassador of Yemen at the United Nations. And so I went up to New York to see him and have dinner, and he uh, and I told him that, the, that 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 it was really important. That I told him that there was that that we suspected there was going to be an attack, and it was very important for Yemen to uh, devise a, to, to 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 get with the program right away, and 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 to be prepared proactively with a plan for how they would cooperate with the United States. So, because the United States, after this attack, was going to be very demanding of Yemen, and they have very high standards for ha high requirements for Yemen to contribute to, to U.S. anti-terrorism policy. So I said, you need to get ready right now, 
and then the attack happened four days later. We had dinner like Friday after, Friday evening, and it happened like Wednesday night. And that was the bombing of the USS Cole. And again... Popeye, can you hear? Yeah, and, oh. again, and again, all of this information... Okay, when you when you went, they they knew who you were. So when you went to them with the information about Iraq and all this other stuff, it's not like they thought you were some crazy blonde bimbo that was out in the you know just coming out of nowhere conspiracy theorists. Oh no! They knew (laughs) who you were. They knew your cousin was Andy Card. You know what I mean? Like. It, 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 they I they had this... known me when I was under Bill Clinton. They knew me when I was under Bill Clinton, and I had a. Uh, I was on the cutting edge of anti-terrorism. I did one of the first investigations of Osama bin Laden in 1998, before the Dar es Salaam Nairobi bombings. I uh, am. I I ran an operation in Libya not only doing the Lockerbie negotiations for the Lockerbie trial with Libya's diplomats, but much more significant. I mean, that was big enough, but much more significantly, we ran an operation to get the terrorists out of Libya and to, 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 to coerce and manipulate, to, to, to strong-arm Libya, Gaddafi, uh, into uh, throw, deporting terrorists who had taken up in sanctuary inside his borders, like Abu Nidal. But there was a whole bunch of them. There were some very small ones that you wouldn't, you know, like Abu Nidal's famous, but many of them are very small and, and, and not famous. And, and those guys were, like Carlos the Jackal and all those guys were getting thrown out of Libya. Um, and it, Richard Clark called it one of the best operations of his career. It was my operation. But the thing is, I had done so much high-level anti-terrorism, and I had a rock in Libya. You don't get that stuff. You don't get to do Yemen and and Iraq and Libya without. And and I had I had Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Malaysia, and um, Egypt. I guess I maybe I said that already. Yemen. Uh, I I had you know seven or eight countries that I covered. Uh, and I was the the expert on these countries uh, in terror in terms of terrorism. I was the proactive, the catalyst force. We were way on the cutting edge uh, long before 9/11. I mean, 9/11 was like the 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 9/11 was was one more case that I had worked on. Um, not to put down 9/11 because it turns out to be extremely important, but obviously for obvious reasons you know, profoundly important. I'm not trying to demean it at all. But I'd been working on terrorism for a decade before 9-11. And, and, and the other thing is, before, and, oh, and this is what I wanted to say, sorry about this, because we, I was telling you about the USS Cole. After the USS Cole, and, and, and I wanted everybody to understand this, because you need to understand the history of the events. After the USS Cole, the CIA, con- you know, through me, I was ordered by my CIA handler and defense intelligence handler to confront the Iraqis and to say, look, there's got to be a better way for Iraq to contribute to, uh, to our anti-terrorism. Uh, because right now, and Iraq said, look, we want to do more, but we cannot arrest these people. Because if we arrest them and they're foreign citizens, even if we know that they're Saudis and they wish to to overthrow the Saudi royal family, if we arrest them, the Saudi government will be all will have will will be demanding our heads. And they're like, we don't want to be, you know, Saddam was adamant about this. We do not want to provide cover for anybody who's going to destabilize, who's going to use our territory as a base for attacking some neighbor of our country because they're trying to take advantage of the lack of centralized control that, that, that is going on under, you know, in the current, under the sanctions regimen because of the, 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 the no-fly zones and the, the Kurdish zones and all this stuff. So Saddam was like, you know, we, we want to we want to do something. We want to have a more effective policy too. So at that point, nine months before nine eleven, this is where I'm going with this. Nine months before nine eleven, the CIA demanded 
that Iraq would have to... We, we were talking about the weapons inspections. We had already started talks on the weapons inspections at the end of the Clinton administration while the votes were being counted in Florida. I was having meetings with the Iraqi ambassador because we, were, we didn't know, we had no idea whether Bush or Gore was going to win, but we wanted to give that new president a big victory and be able to get the weapons inspectors back into Iraq immediately. And the CIA was oh, the CIA was complete had run it up the had run it up the, the the to the top and had approval for this. And then I was going and making it happen. The Iraqis had already agreed to the conditions demanded by the United States. So then the United States threw in this thing about terrorism. They said, "Well, we want because of the USS Cole, we want to send in an FBI task force on terrorism into Iraq." We, we demand authority to conduct terrorism investigations, interview witnesses, and make arrests. And I went, to, I took that to the Iraqi ambassador, Dr. Saeed Hassan, and the immediate answer within three weeks was yes, absolutely, we agree. So, by January and February, at the start of the Bush administration, nine months before 9-11, the Iraqis had already invited the FBI to come in. And as and I, I don't want to go off on 9-11 too much at all tonight, but when I, when I was told to give the warning to the Iraqis and to say uh, we want to, we, we're, we're concerned about, you know, we expect there to be an attack and what intelligence you have on this attack. At that point, so the Iraqis said, pause, well... I'm going to pause this right there because the break is sneaking up on us. So hang out right there. Keep that thought. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. I know you have, you're on the edge of your seat. You're going to have to wait three minutes. We'll be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. So when we got interrupted by the break, Susan was talking about pre-9-11 intelligence discussions that she was having with Iraqi officials uh, you know, in like April, May of 2001 before the attack. And you know, obviously, again, this, this whole myth that the government puts out, we had no idea, no, no idea they would ever fly planes into buildings on such a large scale. Sure, George, sure. Anyway, I digress. So, <clears throat> Susan, you're in Iraq. You're, it's April, May. You're having these discussions about uh, pre-9-11, uh, the pre-9-11 attack intelligence. So go ahead. The floor yeah, that, that's right. And, and what the Iraqis, the immediate reaction was, you know, the, the Iraqis said, well, gosh, you know, we, we certainly want to give you any intelligence. Uh, if you think that an attack is imminent, then uh, you should send the FBI task force. We've already agreed to this. Uh, and why don't you just send the, go ahead and send the FBI and they can do the interviews directly talk to whoever they feel is necessary to get to the to the to, to track down this intelligence and and I want to I want to say again to everybody who who hasn't had the the opportunity to read my book Extreme Prejudice um, that in in April and May uh, I was told by my CIA handler to threaten Iraq that the that uh, if they failed to give any fragment of intelligence that they discovered, even the smallest fragment we were looking for, uh, if they failed to give that to us, then uh, w then the United States would bomb them back to the Stone Age harder than they'd ever been bombed before. And this was very difficult to communicate because the United States had already beat the crap out of Iraq so badly. So communicating that they would do something we haven't already hadn't already done was pretty hot. Was pretty tough. But I told, but I was ordered to tell them this is very important that the threat originated at the highest, the exact wording was the threat originated at the highest level of government above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State. Now then, that's only three people. The President of the United States, George Bush, the Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, and the and uh, the Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, only those three people, and we and by April and May they had already said that they were looking for any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center, and uh, 
and and that the threat against Iraq originated at the highest levels. Now, I want to take you after 9-11. The Iraqis, you know, were, were much more, uh, first of all, the, the reaction of Iraq to 9-11 was scathing. Scathing, how could you let this happen to your people? You, he, they challenged me. This was like a diplomatic back channel. And they said, you were the, so- you meaning me, that I was the source of intelligence on 9-11 and that the United States, that they were receiving, and that the United States, whenever Iraq tried to chase down the fragments of intelligence that I claimed I was looking for, always it circled back to the United States. And they said, and the Iraqi diplomat actually challenged me and said, you killed your own people. You were so, they said this to me, and they were, they were scathing. You killed your own people. You hate us so much that you were willing for your own people to die so you would have an excuse to go to war with us. And they're like, this is the Mossad that did this. This is Israel's work, and they have led you to murder your own people. You, how can you look at yourself in the mirror, Susan? How can you not, how can you not feel the deepest shame? The blood is on your hands, is what they said to me. Now, these were diplomats I'd known for years. So, I mean, the, 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 these, were, these were people who, you know, I existed to be a back channel, Okay, I existed to take that blow, but can you imagine how that felt on September 18th? Uh, the phone records show exactly when I got called from the Iraqi embassy and when I went up to New York. I went up on September 18th and September 24th, um, and I, 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 I did. I, I got the whole. I, I, I got reamed by these people, and it was just. It was so painful in the week and two weeks after 9-11 to hear this and to know it was true. I knew it was true. I was just devastated by it. Now, I want to move ahead a little bit. And again, the Iraqis said, now the Iraqis said two things. They, they said again, vigorously, we invite the FBI, go back to Washington and tell them that we invite the FBI to come into Baghdad just like we did a year ago. Just like we did in January and February, so you must send in the FBI. And the Iraqis also said that they would give us financial documents on Al Qaeda, so that we could figure, we could identify the cash pipeline of monies moving through, uh, through the through the nine through the not the nine through what we call what we today call Al Qaeda. Before 9-11, we called it the, it, it had a different name. It was called, very simply, and I think accurately, the Inter-Arab Network. And that's what we called it, the Inter-Arab Network, because it was a cross-national uh, force of terrorists. Some of them were Lebanese, some of them were Syrian, some of them were Iranian, some of them were Pakistani, some of them were Saudi, and it was Inter-Arab and they had formed a, like a, a, a cabal, if you will, an inter-Arab cabal. Um, but the Iraqis insisted that they would give us financial documents that would help us seize the money. And again, we never had to go to war. If we were serious about anti-terrorism, the most effective thing you could do, as we are seeing today, the most effective thing you could do to shut down terrorism is to seize the money and close down the pipeline. Because if they have no money, they're cash starved, and their operations will fail. And that's why they sell drugs, too. That's why they do the... And the, that can get into the whole Pan Am Flight 103 thing. thing. I mean, it, the 103 thing. That's why it, there's so much... There's so many different levels to this, Susan. It's amazing. I mean, there's... Oh, it, yeah. It's like an onion. You yeah, it is amazing. You start to peel away layers, and you're like, holy crap. So... Look, the drug running, all of this stuff, because it's all connected. Exactly. That, that's, where they, that's where they were getting their money was through drug trafficking. So if you wanted to, you, know, you talk about the war on drugs, if you took away the drug kingpin's money, which they're using to finance violence, 
to destabilize the world's, you know, the global scene and the, the global, the, the global political force. Um, which is what the Arabs were doing. The Arabs were actually tied into the Medellin and Cali drug cartels in Colombia. So you'd actually, if you took the money out of this, you'd actually win two wars. You'd, you'd, you would win the war on drugs and you'd win the war on terrorism without ever having to go to, 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 to send a, a, an American soldier out to die. It was just, it was just, it was, it was, the, you know, the thing is strategically, when you when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and unfortunately, Lockheed Martin. Well, we're going to have to come back to this. Lockheed Martin and on the defense intelligence, excuse me, the defense military industrial complex is 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 is, is driving us towards military confrontation because they're looking for profits. But but let's come back to that because there's some other things I need to tell you. The Iraqis, the Iraqis after 9/11. Wanted, demanded that the FBI should go in. They, you know, they wanted it. They, they felt that it would, the whole world would be safer if they did. They were very adamant about this. And they tried to give financial documents. John McCain responded by saying that he wanted, uh, and Dick Cheney demanded that there was a diplomat in Prague named Al Anai and that he allegedly had a meeting with Mohammed Atta. Well, I will tell you that if he did have a meeting with Mohammed Atta, then Mohammed Atta had set it up with his U.S. handlers to try to create a, a, like a, a honeypot for the Iraqis to try to trap them. And Al and I denied having a meeting with him, and Al and I said, look, I'm a bad Muslim. I would never want to be with those people. I would never want to be with an Islamic fanatic because... I drink, I smoke, I chase women, I gamble, you know. Uh, so, so Al and I denied, but he agreed to have a meeting with the FBI. He said, I will be happy to have a meeting with the FBI. This is not a problem. So it's the very same day, I'm, I was there in the embassy, the very same day that John McCain went on, like I think it was Meet the Press, and he had this morning talk show on, on the, the television, with the corporate media at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, and by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Iraqis had answered, yes, yes, yes. We have already invited the FBI to come into Iraq. We are now inviting the FBI to interview Al and I. We will give you what you want, yes. And we will give the FBI the financial records. And the, thing, the reason they would not give the financial records to me was they said, we do not want this to go to the CIA. We will give this to legitimate law enforcement because we want to make sure that it is actually used. And when you have spooky stuff, intelligence, it can be swallowed up. So they wanted to do it the right way. They insisted that it would have to go to law enforcement. And so that, that was Iraq's response to, to the 9-11 attack. And imagine if we had prevailed on that road as opposed to having the war and what we've done now. Well, see, here's my question. Now I know, okay, look, we're going to get into ISIS and all that in the second hour, but I know that ISIS and all that is controlled by the intelligence agencies and everything to a certain degree, and they're manipulated or steered or whatnot, but like, there wouldn't have been this endless war on terror. There wouldn't be this group of individuals available if Saddam had worked with us because – uh, I'm willing to bet that a lot of the people that would have been exposed would have been people that were connected to some of the very controlled networks that they use to create this unrest. That They have to have a boogeyman. That's what al-Qaeda is. That's what ISIS is. It's this controlled yeah. boogeyman. They'll never let ISIS get out of control and put a caliphate all over them. Are you crazy? They're never going to let that happen. Their whole plan is to bomb them back to the Stone Age, but they need your permission to do it because everybody's war-weary. And now everybody's like, we need to go in there and kick some ass, Susan, because they beheaded two Americans. Well, yeah. and that can, isn't that convenient? You know, why would they poke the tiger? Oh, yeah. Oh, why, yeah. Why would they poke the tiger? I mean, come on. You know what I'm saying? But we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in the second hour. My point is Saddam's involvement on a different scale, like if we didn't bomb Iraq – further back into the Stone Age than the sanctions had already said it. And by the way, that was siege warfare. Okay, I've gone over this before. 
<clears throat> that was siege warfare before we went in there for like 11 Absolutely. years. Absolutely. So we ki- we killed Absolutely. thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, you know, through the sanctions and then we, we 2 million uh, between 1.7 <clears throat> million and 2.2 million. With yes. the sanctions alone or including the the secondary attack or is that just the sanctions alone? Oh no, no, no. Sorry. The United Nations sanctions killed between 1.7 million and 2 million people, including 1 b- million children under the age of five. The United Nations only counted five and five-year-olds and younger. They did not count six-year-olds or seven-year-olds. And the United Nations had calculated that by 1996, 500,000 children had died under the age of five. And the, the sanctions continued from 1996 to 2003, uh, 2003. and so warfare. for another seven years. Yeah, siege warfare, absolutely, and it was brutal, and it was just, it was just, it was, it was absolute starvation. And these were people who, who had nothing to, had no, no threat against us, uh, no threat against anybody. That this was just that no weapons of mass destruction. We knew they had no weapons of mass destruction. That was another great lie that they tried to blame on the intelligence. And it was like, the, the, I was the source of intelligence, and I was like, that's crazy. There's, there's been a, an arms embargo, you know, since, since uh, 1990, let's see, since 1990, 91. Uh, so there, there, there's, it's, it's just impossible to, to imagine that there's, that there's a way that they could have got these guns, well, these guns and, and, and... Little side caveat about the weapons of mass destruction, that one of the popular... Um, one of the popular myths about that, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard this, but especially in the conservative circles, is they smuggled them into Syria. Well, okay, I'm the guy in the back of the class raising my hand. Since um, Syria has had weapons inspectors go in and they took the, the quote-unquote weapons of mass destruction, the sarin gas or whatever it was, they didn't import that from Iraq. That was made there in Syria. They admitted to that. So where's all the WMDs that were smuggled in from Iraq? Oh, they're not. But there, there never were. There well, never were we any. Blew there them never up. were any. That's a we that's blew a them rationalization. Because the they said made in America yeah. on the side of them and they didn't want anybody to see that. So they blew them up at places like Al Camasia and other other installations. And then all those clouds of crap went all over top of the troops and you wonder why you have so many troops affected by nerve agents and everything. But don't pay any attention to that because Gulf War syndrome's not real, Susan. And and human suffering isn't real. Yeah, there you go. You know, dead people aren't real. There you go. You know, millions of dead <laughs> Iraqi kids that that they aren't real. You know, it's all you know. USA, you ugh. It just I just want to beat my head against the wall sometimes. Uh, That's not the truth. Yeah. You know, the truth is no, the truth no, is much more abhorrent. You know what I mean? The, the truth is the truth is definitely abhorrent, and and you know, abhorrent is a good is a good word for it. But at every turn, we and and and, and I want to I want to before the break I want to tell this this story about Abu Musab Zarqawi, um, who uh, most people do not know that he arrived in Iraq. Uh, he had been in Afghanistan and he had, he he traveled through Iran into Iraq trying to get home to Jordan. And Saddam Hussein's people grabbed him. And what they don't know is that Saddam Hussein's people tried to give him to the United States. And he, my own, I was in Baghdad uh, in March of 2002, and Zarqawi was already there. And my contact. He was there for medical treatment because of a gunshot wound. And Saddam had just grabbed him and when he came across the border. This is what Saddam did. You know, he, 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 you, you, you were a quote guest, <laughs> which meant that you were like, you know, you were, you were, you, he was a foreign national, so they couldn't put him in prison. So they put him under house arrest. And then they tried to peddle him to the United States. Well, if you were serious about anti-terrorism after 9-11, you would have grabbed Zarqawi. Zarqawi later became the founder, the, or one of the original founding members of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, now called ISIS. 
and the United States had the opportunity to take him. The Iraqis desperately wanted him to give him to us. They wanted to see him go to prison, and they were stuck. They couldn't. We wouldn't take him from us. We wouldn't take him from yeah, them. I wonder why. Well, because we probably needed him out in the field running around doing his thing because they knew. Remember, these people don't plan. You know this, Susan. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't yeah. plan a year in advance. They, play, they plan 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So they already had this plan laid out for Iraq. They knew what they were doing. Don't you find it kind of convenient? Yeah. They had the chance to nail the future head of Al Qaeda, you know, the the first head, the guy, the founding guy of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Yes. Sure, sure, the founding guy, because who you know, would lead the uh, resistance to the occupation, fighting and killing hundreds of American soldiers, you know, teaching how to put plant IEDs, uh, teaching how to create suicide bombing missions, uh, organizing the Iraqi population against the occupation. And Iraq tried to get, I mean, is this not the height of irony that Saddam Hussein tried to give him to us, this man who would later become the champion uh, of the Iraqi, of the oppressed Iraqi people against the occupation. Saddam tries to give him to us. We refuse. <laughs> I mean, talk about role reversal there. Well, to me, I, to me, it doesn't even show irony. To me, it shows that they were setting the chessboard up long before the game was even played. Even though yeah. they pretended yeah. to be one of the players, Definitely. the chessboard was being set up by by you know their people long before the. I mean, again, how many times have have we said you know in private conversations we've said this on air too? But how many times is just you and I chatting have we said that what could have been stopped? How many lives not. Okay, not just not just American lives, American lives, but let's let's take American lives out of it. Let's say we didn't invade Iraq. How many Iraqi lives could have been saved by working with Iraq? We could have helped them stop 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 the sanctions. We could have brought Iraq back to where it was. It used to be a gem in the Middle East. First heart transplant in the Middle East performed yeah. in Iraq. Okay. They had the best medical yeah. system back in the day. We destroyed that, ladies and gentlemen. We need to own that and admit to it, okay? But instead, and it's not, look, I, I know you might think that not we, but, you know, in a sense, you, we did because we still backed it. We still put up with it, and these people are still doing what they do to this day, okay? And they're, they're, they're getting away with it again. They're, yeah. putting, they're putting it back into the days of Babylon. But my point is, if we had worked with Saddam and we hadn't invaded, can you imagine where we'd be today? Can you imagine, like, oh ISIS my God. wouldn't exist, ISIS wouldn't exist at all. It'd be stunned. So, like, That's the CIA wouldn't be able to get. And I'm not saying, look, not everybody in the CIA. You know, it's 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 usually they we would have we would have shut down the finances for. I mean, without firing a shot, without killing, without send, without deploying a single soldier, we would have cut down terrorism. Uh, we we would have cut out the financial network for out the the terrorists. Uh, and taken away the money from the drug cartels at the same time. And we that would have stolen their profits away. Right, so that would have defunded these people, which we all know, and it would have taken away their Muppets. Which we would have said. starved them for cash. They would have had nothing for recruitment. Well, but, and the the powers that shouldn't be, the people that play the chess game and use us, you know, and all these other different players as pieces, you know, it would have robbed them of yeah. players, and it would have robbed them of this drug money income where they can do and fund all these black ops. Because that's what the drug... There you go. Some of them are into the drugs, but the drug running, the main purpose of it, all goes back to, like, Iran-Contra. When they started running drugs to to fund black ops because Congress would no longer openly on the books fund things. And they like black op money, like drug money for black ops. They like that because it's off the books and they don't have to go to the Congress and deal with congressmen mouthing off to them. Because CIA agents are like, you know, I'm in the field. F you. I don't need this crap. And look... Not every intelligence agent uh-huh. is, is evil, but the people you, – all you need is the people at the top that control things to be the wrong individuals and to be in these little secret societies and these groups, and that's what happens. And then it, they'll end up blaming – And they're people. the ones who take most of the money. Right, exactly. They're, they're the they ones who are right? taking the money. The George Bush family got money out of the Bacaw Valley from the heroin trafficking. George Bush got money off of it. You know, Oliver North and those people, they got some of it, but you, but the big, big people got the most of it, got the lion's share. So it's like the corruption is so, so intense. And they knew, like, for example, Abu Musa, uh, Zarqawi, they knew very well. He was, want, he was, he was uh, 
uh, Jordan had identified him as a, as a potential terrorist. Um, there was an arrest warrant out for him in Jordan, um, and Saddam tried so hard to give him to us as a, as a, as a V, as they kept offering it to us. Please oh, give it, let us, you know, let's hand him off to the United States, uh, because they were going to show that they were, they were, they were committed to the cause. And for those of you who don't know as well, um, not only was there, uh, let me just say this quickly before the break, there was weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, then there were also financial contracts. The Iraqis were offering the United States preferential contracts in all the following areas, health care, pharmaceuticals, and hospital equipment to rebuild their medical facilities, and telecommunications, which is a ka-ching, 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 ka-ching for the CIA. We would have controlled their satellite communications, cell phone, internet, television, all of this would have been controlled by uh, the United States, which would have allowed U.S. intelligence a backdoor into all their computers, their computer software, their every, everything, all of their connectivity, we would have controlled. That's huge. Right. Then so, the United and, States so, was offered... Per- well, I, I want to add this there for a second. So as an agent itself, like as someone who would be like an intelligence gathering agent like on the ground, it wouldn't behoove them to... I mean, I'm sure there, there were people involved, no doubt, but... It, they, they're following orders from people on higher up. The general average intelligence officer gains nothing by doing this because they ended up, you know, they, it's like cutting off your own nose to spite your face. It really doesn't make any sense unless you have a completely different agenda than, quote unquote, exactly. stopping terrorism, which we all know is, pardon my French, ladies, but it's bullshit. Okay. You know, come on. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it really is. It's, it is bullshit. That is the best way to describe it. Yeah. They don't want to stop terror. If they did, they wouldn't have bombed Iraq back to the Stone Age. They would have worked with Saddam. They would have said, you know, we'll work with you. We'll help you out. Give us lists. We'll back off on sanctions. Give us these terrorist networks. They could have, if they wanted to, look, if we really wanted to end quote unquote terror, not you and me, not the people that join the military to a certain extent or even work in the government to a certain extent. I mean, the people at the very top playing this game, if they really, Really, really cared about stopping this it would have been over in like two years they could have cooperated with Saddam again they knew all this and they could have wiped out these groups and ladies and gentlemen everything that Susan's been talking about is in her book Extreme Prejudice go over to Amazon.com and get a copy she's not on here promoting her book she came on because I wanted to talk to her about this but I'm promoting her book because you need to get it I have a copy of it myself <laughs> I've read it it's it's an excellent read. I promise you, you Thank will you. not be disappointed. Susan, I'm going to cut us off because the break is sneaking up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. We're back in three short minutes. Go, Am- go to Amazon. Extreme Prejudice. Get her book. Educate yourself about the reality of what's going on. Just for the rest of the next week and a half, it's going to be a lead up going up to and then in through 9-11. And this is the start of it because this is all connected 13 year anniversary their magic favorite number stay tuned we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen we are back with our number two here on tonight's live edition of down the rabbit hole i am your host popeye from federaljack.com it is september 3rd 2014 it's the wednesday edition of dtrh tomorrow and friday i'm going to be playing some historical stuff for you guys and then uh, all next week I'm going to be getting into uh, it, it, well more, more info, but uh, it's going to be just a nine. Ne- all of next week is going to be a 9/11 info gem. Uh, this week is more historical perspective on the different wars and what have been what's been going on the agenda besides 9/11, you know. And then next week is going to be I mean, from Tuesday till Friday, it's going be, to be nothing but 9/11, and it's going to culminate with. Uh, the 9-11 show I did, uh, a broadcast I aired uh, that I did off air with Mark Passio, uh, we did it about two years ago. It's called The Occult Aspects of 9-11. And since I've been on Truth Frequency, I have mentioned this this broadcast probably about a thousand times. And I've told people to go look it up, but I know not everybody can. So because of 9-11, it's the two-year anniversary of when I uh, aired the original interview that Mark and I did. Uh, Chris Geo, the owner of the network here, is going to do all of you, not just me, but all of you a solid and uh, he's going to cut out uh, my commercial breaks and stuff for um, uh, 
uh, just my, my, my Friday episode next week, and he's going to play because the file itself is actually two full hours on, on the dot. And he's going to play the, uh, the interview uninterrupted because it's got that much information. I didn't want to cut any of it out. And you're going to hear all the different occult aspects of 9-11. You're going to understand how uh, it was a huge cremation of care ceremony uh, to a large extent and all, all of the other different things connected to it. Uh, all week you're going to hear evidence about the official version and you know all this other stuff about politics and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to hear... I'm going to have audio for you from the the victim's family members and stuff. So all of that is totally important, and I'm not trying to dismiss any of that. But then there's also the occult aspect to it, uh, which I know many people are interested in, and I have referenced a billion times. And it's important when you understand the much larger picture and the overall scheme of things. So with that being said, next week, all week, make sure to stay tuned in because it's going to be all original broadcasting I have uh, you know, I, I have planned for you all. It's going to be awesome. All about 9-11 all week long. And then the rest of this week is going to be, uh, you know, what's led us up to this point. Uh, and then um, that's well, it's pretty much tomorrow. And then Friday is going to be a historical look at the Vietnam War because it's, it's pertinent to look not only at Iraq because it's present day, but if, you know, a lot of times that doesn't reach people. It's, they have a disconnect because it's in the news every day and they turn it off. But they can have a, a historical look back at something. Maybe history, they're intrigued in it or whatever. Maybe they like the Vietnam War era. You know, They're interested in it historically, whatever, to a degree. Or they know someone that was a Vietnam vet or whatever. Uh, you know, Friday, you're going to hear some hardcore testimony from the original 1972 Winter Soldier testimony hearings. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, I don't want to waste any more time. I just want to let everybody know, make sure you tune in Friday for that, for the Winter Soldier testimonies from 1972, the original Winter Soldier. You've heard me play the IVAW, Iraq Veterans Against the War ones. Wait till you hear the ones from Vietnam. You think the stuff you heard from Iraq Veterans Against the War was rough? Just wait. Uh, I'm talking about you're going to hear guys admitting that they, they witnessed people bind prisoners uh, with wire and chuck them out of the back of airplanes to see how who could get them to go further. And I expose this because this is what happens with the dark side of war. I don't want to. I don't want to continue to see people, you know, sucking in that evil and feeding off that. We need to break the cycle. So this stuff needs to be exposed. It needs to be talked about. And then once we admit, okay, these are problems, we can fix it so it doesn't happen again. We can learn from our mistakes. As Kennedy said, our errors only become mistakes if we refuse to correct them. With that being said, I want to get back to my guest, my good friend Susan Lindauer, who, by the way, I'm going to make shamelessly plug her book when I bring her back up here in a second and her radio show because she does a hell of a job. I'm very proud of her. Uh, I called her my prodigy before. I meant to say protege. Listen to me. Speaking like a, a American. Yeah, I meant to protege. She, I, I, I bugged Susan for a long time because she's been a friend for years and a guest on my show for years uh, to uh, do radio because I thought she had the, 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 the personality to do it. I mean, that's why the CIA chose her because she's Mrs. Bubbles. That's what I like to call her, Miss Bubbles. So uh, with that being said, I urge you to check her book out and I urge you to check her radio show out. And now I'm going to give the floor to her. Susan, plug yourself shamelessly, my dear. Hey there! Yeah, my book is Extreme Prejudice, and you you really can't you you really have to know your history. This is the the reason that none of this is known to you, and it it, it is really a shame. I mean, I I have to say it's 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 pretty disgraceful that you cannot know my hear my story on Fox News or C, CNN or MSNBC. I should have been. Uh, interviewed by Rachel Maddow, you know, ten times. I should be if she was really the person she thinks she is. I would be on her show as a regular guest. Um, but all of these corporate media are 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 pimping and prostitute prostitutes for the for uh, the, the, the 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 official government line, which is completely bullshit. Uh, everything you, every single thing you've been told was a lie. Saddam Hussein was ready to retire to a villa in Tikrit a year before the invasion of Iraq, and he offered to go. All he, he did not ask for one billion dollars. He said that he would he would retire with a small uh, protection detail from the Iraqi National Guard. 
uh, the, the Iraqi, sorry, the Iraqi Republican Guard, I called them the National Guard, the Iraqi Republican Guard, and he was ready to leave. He, all, he was a survivor, and he could see that he was tired, he was an old man, and he was like, ah, oh, I'll go. You have your elections, I'll go. And the, the, the hatred, the, the, the venality, the obsessiveness, the spitefulness, of the Iraqi exiles was so profound that they could not just let him retire and in, into into history and just ride off and 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 you know disappear onto his you know, his villa. They had to. They had to. They they because and, and and it's very important for you to understand. There was no support for these people. They had no natural constituency that would give them power. They had done nothing for the Iraqi people this whole time, except kill them with the sanctions. And now the only way that they would have a shot at their, their narcissistic ego drama to force themselves into the leadership was if they deprived the Iraqi citizens of all of their rights and came in with boots on the ground and machine guns and pointed guns at the heads of these Iraqi people and said, you're going to support, you're going to vote for me or I'm going to kill you. And talk, who's a tyrant? Saddam Hussein didn't do that. Maliki did it. Alawi did it. And we, we have backed tyrants who are, who are stupid people. Saddam Hussein was not stupid. Saddam Hussein fed his people during sanctions. And Maliki doesn't have sanctions, and he's not capable of doing a damn thing because he's so vicious and spiteful. And that the whole sectarian conflict of Shiite-Sunni divide under Saddam Hussein, these people married each other, they worked together, they lived together, they lived side by side, they were neighbors, it was a community, it was a whole country. And, you know, for Saddam Hussein's flaws, I have to tell you that the Iraqi people were a lot better under him than they are now. Yeah, um, I can tell you that for 110% uh, certainty. And I, it, it it's so frustrating because I have this conversation with people that I consider really smart students sometimes. And they're like, you know, those Iraqi people, like my friends that were over there and stuff, they're like, you know, I remember when they were over there, they were so dumb though. You know, they, they're, they're, they're going to be so far off from this and that and being able to just run government because they're so dumb because Saddam kept them. And I'm like, Saddam, hold on. Saddam had to work with what he had to work with. He wasn't the greatest man in the world, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he was Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm well, the, by the, any the, means. The but problem was that under sanctions, let me, let me just stop you. Bingo. Under sanctions, this is, yeah, sanctions destroyed education for an entire generation of people, of children, uh, they, the five, well, uh, five-year-olds at the time of, of when the sanctions started, by the time 13 years later that the sanctions ended, they were now 18 years old. So between five and 18, an entire generation of your know, millions of people, they, they watch their brothers and sisters die. Sometimes they would lose three or four members in a family, their children, the, the children would watch the other children starve to death, to death, starve to death because of the United Nations. They had no education. They had no school books, no pencils, no, no writing like papers, no writing paper on a blackboard. You'd see it looked like, you know, under the sanctions, the, 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 there was no chalk. They had no chalk to write on the blackboard for the teachers. How could the children learn anything? It was one of the most horrific, unforgivable crimes ever. I despise the United Nations. They are a, 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 a corrupt, self-serving ego. You know, they, they, this is for the elite to send off their sons and daughters to be diplomats uh, because they, you know, it's like it used to be joining the church. Now they join the diplomatic court, the United Nations. Yeah, that way and they don't they have go to and they fight. Party. That way they don't have to go fight and die in the wars their parents create. They send other people's children to go do that. 
That's right. And they go off to the United Nations and they go to, you know, they go to parties and soirees and buffets and they have fancy restaurants and the poorest countries on the earth will have the most extravagant embassy staff who have like the biggest bank accounts. And I know that from Yemen. I know what I'm talking about. Um, they, they, you know, the Iraqis, you know, the, these are the, I, the, the United Nations diplomats were selfish and stupid. They knew very well what was going on. They knew very well that there was no way. And by the way, I, I'd like to tell you something else. <clears throat> Some of you will remember that there were holds that the United States and Britain put on the Iraqi purchasing. Well, it turns out there was a reason for that that nobody knew, and that was that somebody at the CIA had stolen, had gone in to the, the Oil for Food program account at the UN and stolen the money. And so the reason the United States kept putting on these holds and Britain kept putting these holds on these things was because they didn't have the money and they didn't want to admit that they didn't have the money in the accounts to do the purchases of whatever legitimate legitimate supplies were ne- were needed because they'd stolen like like a hundred like twenty I don't know it wasn't a hundred billion twenty billion dollars. That's a lot they'd of money. Stolen it. It was. And and it's but, never but been that was that a lot of children. That that was the whole oil for oil for food scandal. And where where's all that money? Oh, it's gone. Don't worry about it. It's like the what was it two point three trillion they they were saying the day before nine eleven or billion whatever it was that was missing from the Pentagon's coffers. And then all of a sudden, oh, we get a night we get a yep. terror attack. Oh, and it hits in the exact area where Donald Rumsfeld told all the investigators who had amassed all of that information about that to meet him that morning so they could discuss it so they're all there waiting for him and the plane crash comes in <laughs> destroys all the evidence kills all the investigators hmm. very very interesting but, but i'm sure that was you know that yeah. was oh yes that oh was, yes that that's was very interesting and, if I and then they a- try to put out this story that it's lee wanta and it wasn't i know who it did it and it wasn't and there will come a day and i'm going to tell you i'm going to save that one I'm going to save that story for you, uh, Popeye. Because I know who it is. Uh, I think I know who it is. Like just between you and me, I think I already know who it is. But you and I can we'll talk, we'll chat about that off air one day when you're ready on air to talk about it. You let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll clear. I, I promise you, you don't know. It was a Chinese double agent who did it. Really? You it, you you would never guess. You would never guess who did it. You you would. It's something so bizarre, like so, uh, and, but field. so devastating. And yeah, it was a, it was a Chinese double agent who did. It. I know exactly who it is. I know I know the person who did it. I know who did it. I know him personally who did it. And and I and and I'll tell you something. Um, Popeye, and, and I will go, I've, I've got to be really careful. We know, I know, we know, we, the United States of America, know where that money is. We know the account numbers, but because it's being held by a Chinese national tied to Chinese intelligence, the way that it's been set up and protected, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get it out. But, if we could get it out, and and we're, we're and, and 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 that's what I've been to working on. I've been part of that, getting this money back. It's not two point three trillion anymore. It's thirteen trillion. We could almost wipe out the federal deficit. Wow. We could almost wipe out the federal deficit. It's thir- It's been in an account for for since uh, for fourteen. Fourteen and a half years, and imagine. Yeah, I guess. I guess that the moral of the story is, you know, we always wonder what would happen if the United States government did not spend money, and if it took the tax dollars, or in this case, probably, you know, it was black budget money. So it probably came from like some terrorism stuff, or not terrorism, but some drugs and arms dealing and double dealing and stuff like that. But what would happen if we did not spend money from the federal government? Well. 
it would become a fortune, <laughs> which is what this has become. And we may be on the cusp. We well, let me put it to you this way: if Congress does its job, and if the if if the powers that be do their job, we should have that back sooner than you possibly imagine. It wouldn't take long. It would take a few weeks yeah, to they get it back. They don't want to do their. They don't want to Which do that because they're involved in it, and then they would be arresting their own friends, and they'd have to arrest themselves and empty their own bank accounts. No, 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 no. They they could do it. We could do it. We could get that if Congress would stop caring only about themselves. This is the key. Do they if not Congress believe you? Congress cared about the American people and the middle in the middle class. We would be. Oh no, we we've got. I've got documentation. I've got the documentation. No, but I'm saying, do ha, if, have you been I'm, able to like? Have you been able to present this to anybody and try to show them like, or, or do they just blow you off? Yes. No, no. Yes, they know. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. So they're just not doing and, anything and like typical. Just, yeah, it's just like they're waiting for somebody else to take care of it. They're waiting for somebody else to take care of it. And it's reached a point uh, it, this summer. Um, in J- Remember how crazy things got for me in July? Mm-hmm. Personally, you know that my things got pretty crazy in July. Yes, ma'am. Right before that, there was a, a, a confrontation immediately before that. Just like a, a, like a, a week, five or six days. Like, like on July 6th. Uh, I think it was July. Yeah, it was right after the 4th of July weekend. July 6th, there was a confrontation over this money. And then on July 11th, my electricity goes out, and it stays out for four weeks. And when I called Pepco, the electricity company in Washington, D.C., they said, well, your electricity is not slated to be turned off for another two weeks until the 25th. I said, well, then turn it back on. And they said, well, now that it's off, you have to pay the whole bill. But it should never have been turned off at all. But, it, but, but, but turning it off, turning off my electricity, for, and I was off for four weeks. And I had to stop my radio show right when ISIL was, doing its, was coming out and all this stuff was happening with ISIL. And right after there was a big confrontation over this money. And I was saying, get the money now. No more, no more games, no more delays. Get the money now. And then all of a sudden, my electricity goes off, and I call the Pepco company, and they're like, well, it's not scheduled to be for, like, you know, like they give you a shutoff notice. My shutoff notice said the 25th, but my electricity was turned off on the 11th. See what I mean? See, it's just, it's dumb things like that. I mean, you're, but you're this is old says, school. This oh, is a big deal. You're like, no, this is old school stuff. I got to say, look, you can go back and listen to my archives all the way back to 2011 when I first started doing radio. And every time Susan came on, her phone, you'd hear it. Click, 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 click. You'd hear one time we were on the phone. I think we were doing an off-air interview and I, I was playing it later. And there was somebody out on her grass, like behind a tree. She, it got to the point where, and I dropped it in the chat room. You can go look. It's on my YouTube channel, Federal Jack Tube Six. Just go. You can go on YouTube and type in Susan Lindauer will not kill herself. And I'm not kidding you, Susan. You remember this? I made her record audio stating that she would never harm herself or anything, and that her frame of mind is completely <laughs> sane and everything else. Because I was that worried about her, and I immediately put it out there. And it was we put it up on multiple channels, and I played it on my show and on other people's shows. I, I could get on because I, I was concerned that. about you. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah. you were you were going through some really creepy crap, and I mean, she goes through what which I like what you refer to them as spooky people. That's the you know spies, and she would have these spooky type people hanging out on her on her lawn behind trees and like kind of making themselves known to her, but not anybody else, but letting them know that okay. hey, you know, letting her know that we're watching you, we're playing games, or yeah. her phone yeah. would cut exactly. out exactly. They broke into your house, I think, yeah. once. Yeah, weird, it was out of really control. weird things would happen. It was getting really out of control. I mean, I remember you t- you were really concerned. So, I mean, it's just this is not a joke. Susan's not playing games. She's not. You know, I've known her for a long time. When I when I can when I say I can vouch for her, I I can vouch for her. And anybody else that's ever known her for a yeah. brief a long enough period of time, especially like when you when you came out with your book and we were promoting it, 
man, you were getting nailed hardcore. You couldn't even do a conversation with you. Oh, you couldn't God. even record. It'd be like, Susan, you there? Yeah, hi, Pop. I said, you'd get right into it. So, so yeah, Iraq and pre-9-11 intelligence. click. Susan, are you there? No, you'd have to re call you back, reconnect, pop back in. And as soon as you brought certain things back up, it would cut you off. So, I mean, yeah, you're. I know everything you say over the years and in you know, doing the investigative research myself. Yes, she is the real deal, ladies and gentlemen. When she tells you that. She has spooky type people, as she calls them, you know, doing strange things or weird things like her electricity going off. Uh, it does happen. And they, I mean, do they want an for analyst month, like you? For on a air? bloody month. And they say to me, I'm sorry, you're, gosh, your electricity, you know, like if you don't pay your bill, then you get a cutoff notice. Well, my electricity was like, and the cutoff notice will say, you must pay by. In this case, it was July 25th. If you do not pay by July 25th, then after July 25th, <laughs> your electricity will go off. Well, the, but my electricity went off on July 11th, and just the, and then, then then they were like, "Well, since it's already off, we, we're not allowed to turn it back on until you pay us." And I had had an IRS garnishment <laughs> at the start of July, so I had no money at all. And right at this moment. We were doing this big thing on getting the money back, and it's not a small amount of money. It is a very serious amount of money, and we would have the capability. And, and I'm going to tell you, Popeye, that if this does not happen, uh, first of all, I, 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 the, the first thing I did when my electricity went back up, I went to Harry Reid, and I went to Ben Cardin, and I, said, and, I, and I gave them the map for how to get the money back. There's a ve some very, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it, there are some, it, just to reassure your audience, there are some very simple steps that will solve the problem. And the other thing is that will shock you, the same person, and I swear to God this is true too, the same person who took the $2.3 trillion also has bragged I'm not making this up either. And at the World Trade Center, that he he was uh, he was tasked to go to the World Trade Center, and he was traveling on the freight elevator out of the basement, and that he was moving something out of the basement. Well, he was a klepto thief, a kleptomaniac thief of the highest order. This may be this man may be the biggest thief in history, and he bra has bragged that he took something out of the basement of the World Trade Center, which would be the gold. And we, he, has, he has given me the banks in uh, Hong Kong, Dubai, and Switzerland where the gold is. And if the NSA and the FBI and the CIA would cooperate, we could get the gold back for the United States as well. So we get the gold and we'd get our money, and we would have a global reset, a true global reset, not a hyperinflation global reset, because this money has already been in the economy for 15 years. So it's, only, it's, it's not like we're injecting new money into the economy. It's already there. We're getting it back and taking it out of the bank account in the place where it is, which I, I have the account number. Popeye, I've got the bloody freaking account numbers. The problem that they have is that it's in, under the name of a Chinese national. And, the chi and Obama is not very strong in dealing with these adversarial relationships. And it, what, the, well, what I'm saying is, damn it, I'll go do it. I'll be president for a day and I'll go break some eggs and... and, and you know, all, you know, it, it, he's afraid of an inter of a, some kind of you know diplomatic scandal incident. where China's going to hey, let Miss Bubbles do it. She's got the the personality to do it. Susan, I'm going to pause this right there because the break is sneaking up. Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. Check out Susan's book, Extreme Prejudice. We'll be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment, as I have said multiple times tonight. Check out Susan's book, Extreme Prejudice. You can find it over on Amazon.com. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And she's also got a show here on Saturdays and Sundays on Truth Frequency Radio, so make sure you check that out. Her archives are available. 
go check out her archives. I urge you to download her shows. She does really great interviews, uh, and there are times she I mean she does get messed with, and there is a reason for it, and it's not. It's not made up, you know. I mean, uh, technical difficulties can be had, and everybody admits to those. But, I mean, there is, I mean, honestly, I have seen Susan go through some very uh, spooky-type, creepy-type uh, stuff and, like, people harassing her and stuff like that over the years. So uh, it is really, when she talks about it, it is really the uh, the real deal. There is uh, no doubt about it. So, Susan, I want to I wanna switch gears because we got about uh, 25 minutes left. I want to get. <clears throat> I want to switch our gears back onto to ISIS here for a second because this is really important. So, modern day ISIS here uh, that we see running around I- Iraq. I want your take on this whole mess because you you know you were gone, so you didn't have power. So now you've come back. You've seen what's going on. I mean, what do you think about this? Because I see this is what I see. I see that they're letting you know the powers that shouldn't be. Obama is obviously not in charge. He's being told to allow them. And obviously he then you know the Pentagon as well, whoever is telling them to allow ISIS to run amok. They're, they they want ISIS to to run amok because they want ISIS to be able to uh you know what I mean? They they want ISIS to be able to be the boogeyman. They need that boogeyman. You know what I'm saying? They they need people to be afraid. They need a new Al Qaeda because the old Al Qaeda isn't so scary anymore. The old Al Qaeda it's kind of getting, you know, uh, it's become pop culture-y. Bin Laden is quote-unquote dead. They kind of, they ran out their usefulness. So now they got to bring in the new boogeyman. And that's why I see them doing what they're doing with ISIS. So anyway, what's your take on the whole, you know, ISIS, ISIL, is whatever the hell they're t- calling themselves this week and the chaos that's going on currently in Iraq? Well, I think, I think that I, I will surprise you by saying, that I believe, just like Abu Zarqawi, Abu Musab Zarqawi was real, he was a real terrorist, and we let him function, we refused to take him in, and then because of the, the idiocy, and, it's, and I believe it is just stupidity, sheer dangerous stupidity, and a failure to comprehend what war means in a practical, realistic sense on the ground. And then they turn around, just like what they did to me. They know very well that I warned them not to go to war, but then when it went badly, they needed to blame somebody, so they blamed me, even though I told them not to do it, begged them not to do it. And the the thing about ISIS is that, and, and, and here's where I have to agree, I, do, I'll, I may disappoint you to hear me say this, I agree with General Martin Dempsey. I believe that ISIS has an end of days apocalyptic vision and that if we're not going out for them, they are coming for us. It's like for every action in the universe, there is a reaction. And the problem that the United States has now is that we are bankrupt. We are financially bankrupt. Our military is spent uh, broken is, pr- I, I, I don't like to call an American soldier broken. These are strong characters, uh, excuse me, strong personalities, but they have been, they're exhausted. They, they've exhausted their, their capability, and now payback's a bitch. The devil's a charming man, hell's a bitch. And they're coming for us. We have made enemies that are real, authentic enemies. And I think that the real problem for Obama and the real alarm in the military is that we did not want it. We did not want this. We wanted everything to be, you know, we wanted to, we, we, we did this in Iraq, just grotesque action in Iraq. And we wanted to go away and forget about it. Don't hold us responsible for this. Yeah, we did it, but we, we, we're leaving now. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. And, and, and now those people are saying, no, you're not, we're not done with you yet. You're done. You're exhausted. We see that you're weak. We see that you're exhausted and we're coming after you. We're chasing after you. And that's what's happening, I think. I, I don't think that the United States, I think that the United States stupidly imagined, and Obama is guilty of this, 
believing that they could take that anger against the United States and apply it to Syria and Bashar Assad. And so I think that the, the mistake they made, which was a huge mistake, was imagining that they could funnel the rage, funnel the jihadi rage. They ne- it needed to go somewhere. You know, p- uh, p- power hates a vacuum. Uh, the, 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 the anger, the rage needed to go to some place. So they tried to turn it against Bashar Assad, and they did turn it against Gaddafi. But the problem is that it just became like this, this, this frenzied violence. Libya is, has descended into anarchy and chaos. It is, a, it is a brutal, violent society of vengeance, just like you and I discussed at the very beginning of our, you know, when we first met each other, we talked about this on the radio. We did a lot of interviews on Libya during the Libyan War. And, the, you know, when Qaddafi, before Gaddafi was killed, and the craziness of this thing, um, uh, you know, of the, the stupidity, the dan- what the consequences would be for Libya, of the cycle of vengeance. We predicted I, I this. I remember telling you. We predicted that this was going to yeah, happen. Yeah, we did. And, and everybody, let me tell you how great Popeye is. Popeye and Federal Jack put up a page called The Ugly Truth about... Uh, about uh, about the the Libyan rebels. Yeah, Obama's and Libya. Dot it com. has. It, I remember, say that again. It was Obama's Libya. dot com. Yep. And then I put up a web yeah. page. I put up a web page on Federal Jack that linked to all the videos. That was the, it was called the, which was the title you you knew uh, the ugly truth about uh, Libyan war crimes. And it just it was all this stuff. In fact, I have to. Uh, YouTube messed with me, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to air it yet because I, I've been I'm moving the studio. But in the coming weeks, I actually did an interview with the the husband and wife team that were over there, uh, and and sending the videos and stuff, and and working with the the humanitarian thing over there. The, the couple that was oh yes, uh, um, yes. The, the one the ones that were kin- uh, kidnapped while they were uh, there. Joanne. Yeah, Joanne and her husband, uh, and uh, and yeah. Uh, they were, they were, they're just a really nice couple. I'm going to, I have the, it's an amazing story. And these, well, well, now these, these, these videos, but let me, let me just cut you off. Sorry, Popeye. No, 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 go ahead. The these videos the that show the videos. That's what I was beheadings. Getting. They show beheadings. They show, uh, uh, Libyan soldiers lining up and being forced to eat, eat. There's a question whether it was a dog or whether it was a human being, but it was like, a, they're forced to, forced to engage in cannibalism. They showed uh, sodomy. They showed decapitated bodies. It was gruesome, horrific, horrific stuff. And Popeye was the very first. Popeye built a special server. Popeye's friends built a special server that could withstand federal attacks to shut it down. To shut, to, because we anticipated that they would try to destroy and crash the system. And I think that if, when you first put it out, I think, if I'm correct, they did crash it. They destroyed the server like three times. We got hacked once by the IDF itself. Um, we, and then all the other times it was getting traced back to other IP addresses and stuff in places that the guys knew. Uh, my hacker friends were able to, they knew that it was the feds attacking us. The, the way they finally took it down was they took the whole server, including Federal Jack, down. They uh, called in a fake – they used a, a, some program to put in a fake complaint of child porn against the site, but it was like 500 oh. complaints at once, like a, a, like a brute force attack almost. So they, saw our, they shut the server down, and then they, they saw the videos, and they were like, that's not child porn. That's like evidence of war crimes. So they told us, look, some of, I mean the server company told us, you, with stuff like that, you got to be careful because you know, you're going to piss certain people off. So just you know, be careful. And and then they put everything back up within like six or eight hours. But we re, we had gotten attacked so much, and it was taking so much time. After about a year and a half, what we did was we took down o- Obama's yeah. Libya itself, and I took all the videos, and they're available still. People can get them if they go over to federaljack.com forward slash war. Very simple URL to remember: federaljack.com forward slash war. And in that's the reality of war. Uh, section that that's the direct URL will take you right to the download page. If you go, if you're on Federal Jack and you're in the download section, you'll see there's a bunch of different archives that you can download from. One of them is called the Reality of War section. In there, there are nuggets of truth that you have no idea about, and all of those videos that Horrifying. were available on that site 
are in there. Okay, every video that came out of Libya is in there. You want to see what what the the rebels that we were backing and doing airstrikes for? Yeah, we were Al Qaeda's air force. So we helped build this, and yeah. now they want to. That's why I say we look, were Al Qaeda's air force. That's the best thing I've heard. Yes. Well, that, that's, why, that's why I say we built them up, Susan. Like we helped. T- so to me, I mean, yes, I don't get me wrong. ISIS, they're they're not good people, but they're they're a boogeyman that I I think to a large extent some of these people still think they can control. And now they're starting to squabble and say, look, um, I think Frankenstein's monster is getting out of the box, and we need to do something about it before it get, you know gets that in. Now they're missing something like eleven. Did you know? And I just I mean, right around nine eleven, I find it very interesting how all this stuff also starts to occur. But now they're missing something like eleven passenger jets or something in Libya. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. but do they have guys that are capable of flying them? Like, really? I mean, I, I just saw I just saw a video where there was this MiG that it looks it took off and it looked like it was buzzing and flying around. And then the, the MiG crashed because they, they said it was mechanical failure. Right. So and they said it was it was a during a funeral, whatever they were doing, like a flyover or whatever. And it was a mechanical failure. So if a an experienced pilot working for the Libyan rebels right and, and working for the current whatever if they can't fly their equipment are these guys that you know can barely fire an ak-47 or an rpg really going to be able to fly a plane or is it going to be like 9-11 you know what i'm saying i'm just saying susan yeah no absolutely absolutely and can they fly it far enough to get uh, but but here's the thing 11 passenger jets they could never come to the united states but they could make a, fl- a short flight into Egypt or into Italy, particularly Italy or Spain, because it's right on the you know the the, the south of France, maybe for Paris, maybe, uh, but Italy particularly because of the close proximity between Italy and Libya. It's so close. Um, it's so close that it wouldn't be a long flight. That's the kind of thing that I think we're going to see happen. And and would they have the capability to fly to get find somebody who could fly a plane? Yes. Now, do you do you agree that with my assessment that they're like Frankenstein's monster and that they created this to be the boogeyman and now it's getting out of control? But I also think they're also. Yes. I mean, they yes. want to. That's get exactly what I too. think, and that's it. It's getting out of control. They were so stupid. They didn't understand. And that they were that it was going to be that 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 it would ever that that would scenario would ever happen. They imagined foolishly that they would be able to dictate the constraints and they would be able to keep it in its box and they'd pull it out like on a chain. I kind of like imagine like a a Frankenstein's monster on a chain, and you think, oh yeah yeah, it's really scary, but I've got a I've got a chain around its around its waist so it can't run away from me. And I'm going to pull it, you know, I'm going to take it out and have it go, woo, and scare the people. And then I'm going to pull the chain back and, and drag it off to its cell again and keep it locked up until the next time I need to go scare the people. But what happened is, is that it's now broken off the chain. And now it's, it, we are dealing with the, ca- with the, with the consequences, with the, the reaction to our violence. We have lost control. We have lost control of the situation. I have to ask the question, and like, why haven't they? I mean, I, like when I heard Dempsey say, "Well, we're worried about civ- we're worried about collateral damage," I I spit my coffee out all over across my desk. I was like, "Come on, yeah. dude, really?" <laughs> you're, but uh, again, bullshit. You're worried about collateral damage. Well, we can't tell the civilians. Come on, man. There's a a freaking column of vehicles with dudes Where in black pajamas. When have they pajamas. ever cared about civilians? Well, but, but I mean, you got you got a column, Susan, of like three, four hundred vehicles of dudes in black pajamas, AK forty sevens, and and RPGs. You can't tell me that you don't. You can't see with the cameras on those Predator drones and the satellites. What's what? Come on, don't lie to me. They could have parked yeah. a couple missiles. Yeah. They could have stopped this a while ago. So I think that they wanted the boogeyman too, to a certain extent. I think. They're they're somewhat afraid of them, but I think there's still people in power that really think that ah you know we'll we'll take care of it. They're just but I, I think the people that are generally concerned. Well, I think you know there are why? Some that are because upset. of Israel. It, it is, but but hold on. The people who think that it's it's a good idea, the people who are kind of who 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 imagine that they're gonna that they are really in control, that they're puppeteers. That would be the pro-Israeli crowd who desperately needs who craves U.S. military action 
in the Middle East. Those are the crazy nutcases who have inspired the war in Syria. It's like, Jesus, Bashar Assad was a secular, stable, prosperous leadership. There was no reason to take him out. He, had, he, he practiced political tolerance. All these people, all these different sects and religious groups lived together in one country, and they were neighbors, and their, their economy functioned. They had a middle class. Why would you want to destroy something like that? How stupid. You know, what, the, what is the purpose of that? Well, it's for Israel. Israel wanted a shot. Israel knows. Here's, and, 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 and for all of you out there who think that Israel is so great, Israel knows that the United States is going down fast. We're losing fast. We're all over the world. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and apparently Germany, and some of the other big economies, Argentina, um, are, are moving away from the U.S. dollar. And the United States, we're, we're at our zenith. We, we're past our zenith. We're now in free fall. And Israel is trying to clean up as much as they can and reconfigure the Middle East. They don't care about us. If we, we, they're gonna, Israel will throw us off to the side as soon as we're no longer useful to them. But in the meantime, they're going to manipulate us to spend our glory, to spend our political capital, to reconfigure the Middle East in their, to, to Israel's advantage. And when and and that's what this is all about. Two, don't doubt that either. Oh, I've said from the beginning that Iraq only served one country to benefit them, and that would be Israel. And they even admitted that the the only people that benefited from that well, and now China because of all the oil deals. But Israel's the only one that tactically benefited because. Iraq, besides Iran, but I, Iran's technically not in the Middle East. They're kind of technically in Asia. So the Middle East itself, you know, all the, the Arab nations, because the Iranians are Persians. So in the, in the Middle East, yeah. the, the, the Arab nations, Iraq was the strongest. And it was the only one of all the nations there that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Israel and duke it out in a battle. So what did they do? Rather than face them in a battle, they had the U.S. over and the, you know through the U.N. Because don't think that the first set of sanctions wasn't done for the same reason. It was done to weaken the opponent. You take away their nutrition and their food. You bring their opponent. You 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 take away. You know, picture it like a prize fighter. And your prize fighter, you have one guy. He's eating yeah. good food. U.S. military, you know, eating good food, working out, training. The other guy, he's getting minimal training. And he's getting a little bit of food here and there, a little bit of water. And then they put the two guys in a ring. And you walk up and the big dude just walks up and waffles the little guy. Bam! And just knocks him down. That was Iraq part two. Yeah. Okay, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And, and it didn't serve us at all. We lost, we lost a lot of people. They lost millions. And for what? It didn't serve us at all. It just knocked them out of the game in the Middle East. And then it also, for if you understand the bigger agenda, the overall agenda, it ends up creating this chaos. And you know, you know how they are. Order out well, of and, chaos. And the thing is, that what it did. Well, he, here's the thing that was uh, so ironic. Uh, and and remember that the Saudis and the Qataris are financing ISIL, though they're pretending that. They're trying. They, they they keep uh, the Saudis keep demanding that the United States must go into Syria because Syria is a Shiite country with ties to Iran, and the irony was that ISIL, that Saddam Hussein considered uh, his Iraq to be a buttress against Iranian ambitions, and he desperately wanted to restore ties to the United States and to Saudi Arabia. But the stupid Saudis, again, they were so vicious and ugly and nasty. I, Saudi Arabia is one of the countries I truly hate on this earth. I absolutely hate them. Um, and they, they, but the, the Saudis uh, imagined stupidly that they would knock out Saddam and then there'd be a new, Shi a new Sunni government. But no sooner did that happen than the Shiites took over. So it was very short-sighted. 
And now Maliki's government is so t- The only way that Maliki ha- was able to hold on to power at all was because of his ties to Iran, which is hated, 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 hated by the Iraqi people. They, you know, they don't like what he's been doing. They hate that man. Um, but the only way that he could hold on to power was... So, so the, the Saudis had the effect of, by destroying Saddam, they had to cre- they, there had to be a strong Iraqi-Iranian alliance which is a contradiction, contradicts the, the per, self-perceived Saudi interests and the, the interests of monarchy. Um, a, the, 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 you know, the push for democracy is a contradiction of monarchy. So you, you have this, 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 the Saudis who have, who have completely miscalculated at every level, and now they are, the Saudis are afraid of ISIL because they don't have control over them either. And ISIL would like nothing more than to come back into Saudi Arabia and knock out the royal family. Believe me when I say they hate the royal family, too. So, so it's like, is Saudi, this is my question, I even said this the other night, if Saudi Arabia is so afraid of them, why don't they just stop funding them? Or is it to the point where it doesn't matter if they stop funding them? Well, but the thing is, yeah, that's a very good question. It doesn't I, make I any sense to me. But you better keep feeding the tiger, because if you stop feeding the tiger, the tiger's going to turn around and attack you. Well, I mean, Saudi Arabia, they have a decently equipped military. Why don't they just go in there and work with the United Arab Emirates and all these other Middle Eastern countries and say, look, we all may not get along, but these guys are batshit crazy. They're out of control. I mean, if it's oh, true, that shit look, crazy, if, it's, if it's true that, like, say, you know, I know they're all controlled by Mossad and CIA, but let's say, you know, Al Qaeda actually said, "Hey, look, you know, we want nothing to do with these people." Like, like if everybody, if they're that bad, then why don't all of these people? America shouldn't have to intervene. The United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and all those other Middle Eastern countries, Egypt, Jordan, look, they all have pretty badass militaries in their own right. If they all got together and worked in unison, ISIS would be a memory in like 72 hours. Okay, it's that simple. Those guys, it's not like they're bumped, their militaries are, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Units. I don't think it is that simple. I don't think it is that simple because all the governments you're talking about, they have militaries, but they're hated by their own people. There is deep, deep, deep disaffection. But do you, don't you the think young that if they don't particularly you think, don't are think, very angry? And let me tell you, the Palestinian factor, the Palestinian quotient is devastating because ISIS has told the Palestinians that they will fight, that they are the only group willing to fight to get the Palestinians back into Israel with a capital of Al-Quds in East Jerusalem. Do you think they're doing and that? They just are the all, and I think what's going to happen, let me just tell you what I think is going to happen, that all of these, you know, the United States will have, there will, I think there will be a major terrorist attack. I think that we'll expect to see them in Europe. I think that the King, the King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia is dead on the mark. First, there will be an attack in Europe, and it'll be major. It might even involve these 11 airplanes. Uh, but it will be something big in London and uh, Rome, particularly. And then you'll see another attack on the United States, and a big, big attack, a big, big, big attack um, that should be pretty scary. And we're so weak financially. That's why, you know, I've been fighting to get this money back. Um, And we'll talk about the money another time. But we're so weak that we can't, We'll, we'll collapse. We're, we're poised for economic collapse anyway. We will implode at that point. And then when that happens, the all ISIS and all the Arabs, the Hezbollah, the Iranians, all of them will unite together against the royal families who are favorites of the United States. Jordan will fall. Jordan is expected to fall. My sources inside the Middle East tell me that they are expecting Jordan to collapse. My sources are saying Lebanon is expected to collapse. And they think that Lebanon is next before Jordan. But that the two are going to be like within six months, by Christmas, Lebanon will be in a full-fledged war just like Syria. And 
by next June, a year from now, next summer, Jordan will also be in war. Okay, and then what's going to happen is the next stage is that all these Arab peoples will unite because they'll instead they'll, they'll be like instead of fighting against Bashar Assad and King Hussein of Jordan and and the Lebanese government Hariri, they will they will turn around and they will all together, you know, they, they'll make a peace with each other. The, the way that they will make a peace is that they will identify a greater enemy. And it may be the Saudis who will pay them to do it. The Saudi-Israeli alliance will be smashed because the only way that these that the, that these government that the existing governments of these countries will have any chance at all is if the rage is turned against another enemy. And I think that's what brought with what Obama was trying to do. Obama imagined. I thought Susan, this when Susan, I saw I'm gonna Libya. Have to cut us off. We're, I'm going to have to have you back on and talk about this because uh, we're running out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, check out her book, Extreme Prejudice. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. I'll check you all again tomorrow night.